Um, everybody see the slides? Yes. Yep. Okay. So, so thank you to, for inviting me to this this virtual event. I um, got the chat and the participant window up. So, if you would like to you know, virtually raise your hand or type something into the chat, I will do my best to pay to notice that. If I fail to notice it, feel free to interject and ask anyway. Um, but I'm very glad to be here and tell you about some of the work that we've been doing in developing formally verified cryptographic code as part of the Project Everest. And our, our motivation for this work actually came from the, the world of HTTPS, which is possibly the world's most commonly used security protocol. And that's partly because we as security practitioners tell people, don't invent your own protocols, right? It, it, you're probably gonna do it badly and you should use something that's well tested and well understood like HTTPS. Unfortunately, that makes it really embarrassing when there are bugs in that ecosystem. And we've seen 20 years of problems ranging from low level problems like heart bleed, basically buffer overflows, to problems with these standards themselves. And so it's really bad if we're telling everybody to use these protocols and yet those protocols are not themselves secure. And that was the motivation for starting Project Everest, which started about three and a half years ago. And our goal there was to take each one of these components and replace it with a, a fully verified replacement. And then to verify not just that the individual components are secure, but that the composition of all the components together actually gives you that high level cryptographic goal of an, a secure or uh, secure channel. And one of the things that we also wanted to focus on was not just producing something that was verified, but to make it deployable. So in our vision, it should be a, a easy one-liner to take whatever you're running now and replace it with something better and more secure. And of course, that means that we need to provide something that's easy to plug into existing code. And crucially, it needs to be fast. Because historically, the world has, when offered the choice between something secure and slow and fast and uh, insecure, has typically gone for something that's fast. And of course, we don't want this just to be, you know, that we heroically produce this one, one piece of verified software and then walk away. Ideally, we want to improve the tools that we're using along the way so that others can come along and say, hey, you know, HTTPS is nice, but I really care about um, things like Kerberos or SSH. And so we want to see this as a, a growing and, and thriving ecosystem. Now, this is obviously a, a large task and it's actually a, a massive collaboration. This is a, a snapshot from a couple of years ago. Uh, we draw from various parts of Microsoft Research, uh, NRIA, Carnegie Mellon, and many different disciplines ranging across uh, computer science. And all these people and more have worked on this to help make, make it come together. As a, a brief snapshot, I think this is a, a decent approximation of where we are at this point. You can see we've made a lot of progress on the uh, cryptographic code I'll talk about today, as well as things like parsing and handling X509. We made a decent amount of progress on TLS, and we still need to climb a little bit higher up the pinnacle before we get to HTTPS. Along the way, there's a bunch of papers that you can find on our, our project website. And I think, interestingly, we've had a number of spin-offs. So we've had some projects looking at how we can verify quick, which is related to, but different from TLS. And even things like verifying something that looks kind of like Intel's secure guard extensions or SGX, but doing it with a lot less complexity in the hardware and more pushing more of the management into software. We've also been reasonably successful in our goal of pushing this out to uh, use in practice. So Microsoft is using it internally for various purposes. A couple of blockchains are using it. Uh, the Linux uh, WireGuard VPN has started adopting some of our cryptographic algorithms and has actually uh, the author behind that has worked hard to get it incorporated into the Linux kernel. And Firefox has also picked up some of the algorithms. So I think we're, we're having some, some impact that way. So today, given our, the amount of time we have available, I decided I would focus on uh, the cryptographic side of things, particularly looking at our EverCrypt cryptographic provider. So this is one of the places where we, we've made a lot of progress. And this work was motivated in particular by the fact that Today's modern crypto providers are actually very effective if you don't consider security. So what do I mean by that? I mean that users care a lot about speed and the crypto providers have responded. So the fact that today you can get authenticated encryption, which is sort of the gold standard for symmetric encryption at less than one cycle per byte is really impressive. Um, and they've really you know, gone, gone all out trying to get this performance, but unfortunately the consequence is perhaps not surprising to this crowd, we've seen a lot of vulnerabilities in, in these libraries. That's 24 in OpenSSL in their crypto libraries. So that's not including the larger 
problems with TLS or with their implementations of X509. This is just the, the cryptographic code. And the reason I think that this came about is if you dig into the OpenSSL code, you'll start to see stuff like this. And I suspect even in this crowd, you may have a little bit of trouble deciphering what's going on in, in this bizarre code snippet. And that's because it's written in this weird mix of Perl, assembly, and CPU processor macros. And it's attempting to target something like 50 different hardware platforms. If you count all the different variations of x86, x64, SSE, AVX, AVX512, ARM, ARM Neon, and, and so on. So openness is all trying to be sort of uh, something for everybody. And yet, this is not something that you really feel comfortable trusting the security of the internet to. Right? This is messy code to even hope, hope to comprehend, let alone test or, or verify. And so you might be saying, this is madness. Why would anybody write code like this? And of course, the answer comes back to performance. So if you look at any benchmark uh, for cryptographic code, you'll see that OpenSSL is typically winning. So this happens to be hashing. And you can see that OpenSSL is pretty handily beating other open source cryptographic libraries. And furthermore, they're doing it not just to eke out performance compared to compiled code. They're also doing it to take advantage of hardware specific instructions. So this graph is showing that if you write in C or vanilla assembly, the green and the red bars, you get OK performance. But if you write hand-tuned assembly code that's taking advantage of AES and I, which is a set of instru instructions from Intel, you can get a 4 or 5x boost in your performance. But of course, you can only get that performance if you customize for each major or even sometimes minor hardware platform, because that's how you really get the, the most out of the hardware. So you might say that verified crypto ought to be able to solve this problem, right? We're, we're at FCS and we should be taking all these techniques from the formal methods community and applying them to cryptographic software. And indeed with, with the power of verification, we can actually mathematically prove that we're, we're doing our verification correctly, that we've say correctly implemented RSA, and we can even start to take it to the next level and prove that we aren't leaking secrets, right? So we can actually write proofs showing that the runtime that it takes to execute or that the memory accesses are secret independent. In fact, there's been enough work in this space because academics have been paying attention to this, that uh, my colleagues and I actually recently wrote a, a systemization of knowledge or, or survey paper trying to summarize all the activity in this space. And so maybe we should just stop here, right? We can be done, we can go to our coffee break early because verification has clearly solved the problem of, of cryptography. Unfortunately, if you dig in a little bit more, you'll start to notice that there's actually a fair bit of work required, a gap between what people would like and what, what has actually been done in the literature. So for example, a lot of the work, while it's been very interesting from an academic standpoint, sort of helping us understand how to verify cryptographic code, has only actually verified portions of crypto code. So for example, if you look at Fiat Crypto, which is a, a very cool system for verifying elliptic curves, it doesn't actually do any crypto on top of the elliptic curves. It just does the elliptic curves themselves. Or in some cases, the verification is only of a, a single algorithm. So it proves that SHA-256 is good, which is fine. But if you want to use SHA-512, you're out of luck. You have to go start from scratch. And so what we wind up with is instead of having this, this brilliant race car of your dreams, you instead get something like half a steering wheel, uh, a muffler, and a whole lot of cars, a whole lot of tires. But you're, you're missing maybe an engine and a, and a driver's seat. So that's not so great. And even if you took all these pieces and somehow cobbled them together, you would find that they're all verified with different specifications, different formal tools, and it's not clear how you would formally connect all those pieces. And historically, we've seen in our own efforts that if you don't verify the connections between different pieces, that's exactly where the, the bugs are gonna creep in. And unfortunately, for most of this work, the performance is significantly behind state-of-the-art systems like OpenSSL. And if you show up with a tool that's 100 times slower than what's currently there, then it's going to be hard to make that sale. In fact, one of my colleagues who works at uh, a major cloud provider estimates that something like 5% of their entire power budget goes just to doing low-level cryptographic operations. And so if you show up and say, we're going to make that 100 times more expensive, you're actually talking about a significant power expenditure, which translates into real money. So that's what, part of what motivated us to start working on the system we call EverCrypt. And we wanted Evercrypt to be comprehensive, so that it was the full race car that you were hoping for, to offer a, a modern API, which is something that we should be offering from any crypto provider, verified or unverified, and to, of course, hit this, this goal of, of high performance. So in terms of comprehensiveness, um, 
we try and include everything you might need while building your application. So for example, we include a, a wide variety of the crypt basic cryptographic tools from low level ciphers and hash functions to larger constructions on top of them. So like encryption modes or signatures and key data. And we've also adopted high level APIs that have been developed in the unverified world, such as the box and secret box from the NACL library. These are designed to make it very difficult to do the wrong thing by handling almost all the, the cryptographic decisions internally to the API, internally to the, to the library. Now, as a result, I believe we've developed the, the largest cryptographic code base ever in terms of verified code. It's 124,000 lines of verified code and produces almost 30,000 lines of C and about 14,000 lines of assembly. And that goes back to our goal of trying to make it easy to integrate. So by producing C and assembly, people who don't care at all about verification can plug this into their existing systems and hopefully benefit from all the work that we've put in. So when it comes to verifying the cryptographic code, we want to offer what I call a, a modern API. And so I'll touch on a few aspects of that and then get into how the, some of the technical details of the, the verification underneath that. So when I say modern API, I mean that we want to be able to offer generality. So we want to be able to offer lots of algorithms, but we don't want that to cost us in performance. We also expect modern cryptographic providers to be agile and, and offer abstractions to the clients and also various forms of usability and cross-platform support. I'll touch on a, a few of these in the next few slides. So when I talk about generality, if you take a look at this sort of block diagram here, hopefully many of you will recognize the, this, this basic structure. Right? This is the, the classic merkle damgard construction for taking a fixed sized hash function, the lowercase h, and turning it into a, a hash function that works for arbitrary inputs. And this, this structure is shared across many hash functions, MD5, SHA-1, the various flavors of SHA-2. And you can take advantage of this when writing your, your code, especially writing your, your verified specifications, by writing one generic specification for this basic construction and then having specializations for the, the different flavors of it. This reduces the size of the specification, which is always good because ultimately the specification has to be trusted. And it can also make our, our verification efforts easier because we write fewer proofs because we can write sort of generic proofs about this structure and then more cheaply instantiate them per, per uh, algorithm instance. Now, of course, if you did this naively, you would wind up with very poor performance. So for example, here's a, one of the, the leaf functions in uh, one of our hash algorithms. And you can see that it's parameterized over the hash algorithm in question. So we don't know if we're doing uh, which flavor of hashing we're doing. And we're taking in two words. And it turns out that these different hash algorithms have different notions of state. So some of them have 32-bit state and some have 64. And so we're doing a, a case split on which algorithm we're executing and deciding which version of uh, bitwise and we're going to execute. Now, of course, if you actually emitted C code that looked like this, that would be crazy, right? You'd be carrying around this extra state dynamically, which is you know, a bad idea, and you'd be branching at every single low-level operation. Fortunately, our, our proof tool, in this case F star, is able to use a clever combination of partial, partial evaluation and inlining to actually get all the way back to C-like code and uh, hence C-like performance. So when we want to define what it means to do SHA-224, we actually partially evaluate this compressed function at the top level with the constant representing that exact algorithm. And then F star and a combination of F star and our sort of careful coding practices means that this constant will be propagated throughout our code. And when it gets down to here, it'll realize, okay, this, the 64-bit branch is now dead and I can admit just a, a 32 bitwise AND here. And so you wind up with code that looks very like idiomatic C code. And so the result is good looking code that we've been able to write and prove in a nice high level fashion. Now, another aspect of modern cryptographic code is that it should be agile. And this is because we want to be able to adapt to changes in the cryptographic landscape. So by agility, I mean that the client code should be written against an abstract API representing the cryptographic functionality that you want and not the underlying algorithm that you happen to choose. So the client code should know that it's getting authenticated encryption and it should be able to use the exact same API regardless of whether we're using an old algorithm like ASCBC plus HMAC or something more modern like ChaCha or ASGCM. And the goal is that this way we can adapt to uh, say a, a new cryptographic break in one of these systems. No, no, no. So 
for example, when SHA-1 was broken, it took the, or the collision resistance started to break down, it took the, year, the world five to 10 years to migrate away from SHA-1, which is way too slow for that kind of change. And of course, someday we may have to contend with quantum computers. And I think rather than frantically rushing out and replacing all of our, our crypto with quantum resistant crypto, we should be replacing our, our cryptographic libraries with agile cryptographic libraries, libraries that can, at the drop of a hat, change and that way we'll be so sort of protected from both the sort of traditional cryptographic analysis as well as advances in, in computing power. And you can do the same thing for other cryptographic functionality. You can say, I need a hash function and the client shouldn't care whether the underlying hash is SHA-1 or something more modern and more resistant. And the nice thing about this, this design is that we can couple it with abstraction, which is another good principle when it comes to cryptographic libraries. This is good both for unverified clients because it encourages agility the more you hide from the client, the less they can take inadvertent dependencies on your particular instantiation. And it's also a, a huge benefit from a verification standpoint. So if the client sees a, a very simple, small API, then their proof context isn't cluttered with all the details of the underlying, say, hash function. So if you're trying to write a, a proof that your, your client is secure, you don't really care which hash function it's using as long as it's a, a secure hash function and your proof shouldn't depend on the low level details of say how SHA-1 operates. So to make this a little bit more concrete, here's an example of our, our hash API. From the, the C client standpoint, they see an anonymous struct for the state, which means that they can't even take a dependency on the, the size of the state. Instead, they can only create a pointer to that state by specifying the algorithm that they want to choose. So this is the one place where the algorithm is specified but the rest of the API is entirely agnostic to that choice of algorithm. And so what that means is that if you want to change to a new hash algorithm, you pass a single, you change the argument that you're passing here and the, all of your rest of your code should adapt accordingly. So in addition to agility, we want to provide an API that's usable. And we're actually designing the API to be usable by both verified clients and unverified clients. So from the verified client standpoint, what we want is a, a clean, complete specification of what's happening internally. And the cleanliness, again, is necessary to keep the proof performance of the higher level applications uh, moving smoothly and not cluttered with uh, unnecessary facts. But we also can't rely on the preconditions that we would normally do with verified clients when we're talking to unverified code. So we want C clients to be able to call directly into our, our crypto library. And that means that we need a defensive C-level API as well. I mean, it's going to check for mistakes that the C client might've made. And of course, there are a whole bunch of details about offering clean APIs to C clients, things like making sure that you have a, a consistent calling convention, making sure that it looks idiomatic, returns proper error messages. All these low-level engineering details make a big difference when it comes to actually using code and deploying it, integrating it with, with code in practice. Finally, these days, people expect your, your code to be cross-platform. Right? So it's not enough to say, hey, we have a, a version that works on this particular flavor of Intel as long as it has AS and I instructions. That will be nice, but nobody wants to, at the higher level, have to be thinking about those level details. They just want crypto. And so to support that, we've developed some tools for verifying C-like code, which is in a, a fragment of uh, F-star, which is called Lowstar, and that can be extracted to idiomatic C code. And we've done that quite successfully with uh, the Hackle library, which is a uh, dedicated library for portable C code. And then we also want to verify assembly code because that's how we're gonna get sort of the ultimate in performance for individual platforms. And for that, we've developed a tool called Veil that I'll talk about in a couple of slides. Now, to bring these two together, we have to talk about what it means to interrupt between C and assembly. Because ultimately, we want to give the same high-level specification to the, the cryptographic code, and the client shouldn't have to care which implementation we're using. In fact, from the client's standpoint, we should mathematically prove that no matter which implementation we're using, the C or the assembly, you, we will mathematically guarantee that you're getting the same answer on both sides. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to relate these two because even though C is typically considered a, a low-level language, it actually uses different abstractions than what you typically use at assembly level. This is true both for the memory model and for how you analyze side channels or even think about what the, the specifications look like. Fortunately, we're able to take advantage of our proof assistant, in this case, F star, which supports uh, dependently typed arity generic programming, which is a, a very 
complicated way of saying that it's able to handle uh, functions that have arbitrary number of arguments and reason about their, their types dynamically. And that means that we can write a, a single proof about the calling convention, and that can be parameterized both by the calling convention and the particular uh, interop interface that we're using. So rather than proving that each call from C into assembly is done correctly, we write a, a one-time proof and then instantiate it for different calling conventions. This means that we can support calling conventions like Microsoft's X64 and the System 5 AMD64, which is used in Linux and BSD, and even GCC inline assembly. And these are all covered by the, the original proof. And we're able to use this for, for many calls between C and assembly, including big complex ones that would be unmanageable, um, which I can tell you from previous experience, trying some other approaches that, that did not work out so well for, for trying to manage all this complexity. So I've talked about verifying assembly code, and I thought I would go into a little bit more detail about how, how we go about that, just to give you some more technical meat. And this, again, is motivated by the fact that we want to be able to match OpenSSL's performance tricks. Because if we can't do what they're doing, then they're probably going to beat us on, on performance. So this is a, a small snippet of the code I showed you before. And as a reminder, it's mixing assembly and Perl to get the advantages of low-level assembly without having to write all the assembly by hand. And the, what they're doing here is they're actually assembling it as a, a Perl string which it turns out is going to be interpreted later by another bit of Perl code to actually emit the, the final strings. So you can imagine how gnarly that gets. It's also using these C macros for target instruction selection. So it's saying, if we happen to be on ARM, a particular flavor of ARM, then we're going to emit this code, otherwise not. And it's using C macros for that because those are the, how the rest of the code, the rest of the code base is being customized per hardware platform. And it's also using it for code specialization. Now, it's un actually unclear to me why they're using it for code specialization when they're already writing in Perl, but that's how they've chosen to do it. And so they're saying, if in this particular round, we're on round 15, emit some code, otherwise emit some other code. They're also using Perl level loops to do assembly level loop unrolling. So here we're doing a, a loop that would otherwise be done dynamically. We're actually unrolling it 16 times. And as we go through that loop, we are using Perl register names and shifting them to change the names of the registers without actually doing any moves between the registers. So again, this is super clever and I'm frankly amazed that they managed to produce correct code this way, but this is not the kind of hackish code that you would like to see underpinning the, the security of the entire internet. Right? This is the kind of code that you stare at for a long time and then you finally say, oh, okay, I, I kind of see what you're doing there, but you don't feel warm and fuzzy about it particularly because the end result is code that looks like this. It's very hard to understand it, it's hard to debug, and it's very hard to formally verify or say anything meaningful about the, the correctness or security of this code. So, uh, sorry, I see, see uh, there's a question from the audience. Um, can we elaborate on the defensive C API? Yeah, so uh, let me pause for a moment, I'll, I'll talk, talk about that and then go back to assembly. So in a bunch of places in the high level API that we, don't, that we offer to verify clients, we will put preconditions on say the length of the arguments or that the, the state that you're passing us matches the algorithm that you're, you intend to execute. On the, the C level, we obviously can't have any of those preconditions. And so our verified code has no preconditions, but we have dynamic checks. We'll check that the length is correct and that you're using the correct algorithm. In fact, we try not to expose the algorithm choice to you so that you can, all, all you can do is hand us a struct that already has the algorithm encoded in it, and then we pull that back out and, and use that dynamically. The performance hit from that is, is pretty small, and we think it, it's worthwhile to avoid assuming anything about what the VC client might be doing for us. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. So our, our motivation for developing the bail tool was to try and match all this craziness that's going on in the OpenSSL world but do it in a way that actually lets us prove security properties of the underlying code, proving both that it's correct and that it's secure. And the way we do that is by, we developed a, a custom tool called Veil, which defines its own language for writing cryptographic code. It looks very similar to regular assembly code, except augmented with pre and post conditions, as well as some of the dynamic tricks that we saw with uh, the OpenSSL code. For example, doing uh, loop static loop unrolling. And the Bell tool produces an AST representing the, the, the assembly code. 
as well as a bunch of proofs about that assembly code. And we pass that off to our proof assistant. Now, of course, we also have to give the proof assistant a specification for what we're trying to do. So say we write down a mathematical spec of what it means to do SHA or AES. And then we also have to write down the semantics of how the underlying machine behaves. So we've actually written our own uh, formal big step semantics for x86, x64, and a, a version of ARM. And the proof assistant is going to try and verify, given the semantics and the specification, has our tool actually accomplished, or has, has, does our code actually meet that specification? And typically, it can't see that on its own. And so we also have to write a bunch of lemmas in our proof assistance language to help the prover along and see why we believe this is correct. Now, Veil is designed to be agnostic to the underlying proof assistant. And so uh, we can actually replace the proof assistant with any other verifier. So we actually have a backend for a tool called Daphne. And our most sort of elaborate one is for F star. But in theory, you could use your, your favorite proof assistant as well if you provided the correct hooks for, for Veil to connect to. And once the, the verification succeeds, we then hand the, the abstract syntax tree off to an assembly printer. And that just walks over the AST and prints out vanilla assembly code. And then we hand that off to an, an unverified assembler. And we support multiple assemblers to, again, try and support multiple uh, uh, the deployment in multiple tool chains. So changing the diagram a little bit, we can factor this into the, the trusted components. Right? So we have to trust our specifications that we describe the crypto that we want to do correctly, that we got the hardware correct, and that our, our verifier and all of the verification tools are correct. Um, we check all the ASTs and proofs and the, the libraries that we, we provide. And we don't have to trust the lemmas that we write, the cryptographic code that we write. And fortunately, we don't have to trust the Veil tool itself. So even if there was a, a bug in the Veil tool and it was producing incorrect code or incorrect proofs, that would be caught by, by our verifier. So you can kind of, if you've ever worked with uh, proof assistants, you can probably intuit how the correctness proofs are going to go. But I thought I would talk a little bit more about how our, our secrecy or, or security proofs look like. So when I, when I talk about security of low level cryptographic code like this, one of the main properties we want is absence of leakage. So in particular, we don't want to be leaking secrets through digital side channels. So meaning, say, how long it takes the code to execute or the memory addresses that we happen to access. But we also don't want to leak information through uh, state of the program. So there's been some classic studies that show that when you have a secret lying around in memory, it actually can wind up spread all over your, your system if you aren't careful. Because right? your operating system might page some of it to disk, and then maybe that, disk, that uh, region of memory gets reused for some other purpose. And so we'd really like to make sure that after we finish executing, there's nothing left in memory that has been influenced by our, uh, by our secrets, say our, our cryptographic keys. So in our work, we, we take a, a fairly standard definition of leakage based on non-interference. So, so formally, what we say is that for all, if you have two, two pairs of secrets, S1 and S2, and you have some fixed public value P, then the observations from executing the code with P and S1 should be equivalent to the observations executing the code with P and S2. And by observations, what we mean is we're going to assume that the adversary can see all the branches that we take and every memory address that we access for, for reading or writing. And the way we, we specify this is that we actually expand our formal specification of the hardware to be not just functional, but also to include a trace of observations. So the state of the underlying hardware includes registers and uh, where the CPU is executing, but it also includes a, a ghost trace that captures these observations. And every time we take a step in the semantics, we look at, say, which instruction we're evaluating. And if there was a, a memory address involved, we add that address to the trace. And if there was a, a branch, we add, we add which branch we took. And so we're accumulating this long sequence of observations. And our proof that we hope to show is that that sequence remains the same regardless of what the underlying secret happens to be. So that's the goal. How, how do we get there? Well, our approach is based on uh, verified analysis. So we take, developed a, a tool written in F-star that will do a, a fairly standard taint-based analysis on the AST. So it's going to walk over the abstract syntax tree and decide, based on taint flow, whether we're leaking secrets. And the nice thing about writing it in F-star is that we can then write a proof that this analyzer is sound. And we write that proof against the specification that I just showed you. 
And the nice thing is that we can then trust the output, the yes or no output coming about, because we've done this one-time proof of the correctness or the, the soundness of the analyzer. So, and we can trust this as long as we trust the specification. But the nice thing about something like non-interference is you can actually write it in a, a fairly succinct manner. And so the hope is that by manually inspecting the spec and going through this extra effort of writing this generic proof about our tool, we can then save effort when we verify different cryptographic algorithms. So we can feed the, each AST that we come up with, we can feed into this tool, the tool runs, and automatically gives us a yes, no answer without any further proof effort. Now, if you've ever looked at trying to look at, do leakage an analysis or any kind of code analysis for that matter, you were probably a little bit suspicious of this because there's this classic problem of aliasing, right? And so, for example, here we're storing zero into the memory address held in RBX, and then later we're loading from memory uh, the value at uh, address RBX and sticking that into RCX. And if in between those two, we have a, another store to the address held in REX, then we've got a problem, right? Because we have to figure out, does RCX contain zero or 10? And the only way to answer that is based on knowing are REX and RBX the same or are they different addresses? Right? That's sort of the fundamental problem with aliasing. And Unfortunately, there isn't a great answer in the literature, uh, so classically, to, to solving this problem. One, prob one approach is to try and analyze it while you're still at some high level language. So there's maybe a language that's designed to help you detect such leakage. But of course, then you have to trust the compiler. And we've seen that in the past, the compilers can introduce not just correctness problems, but also si additional side channels. And that's to some level fair because you know, most compilers aren't designed to prevent such side channels. Another option would be to try and do pointer analysis at the level of assembly code, but that's inherently going to be imprecise, right? Analyzing assembly code is classically hard and pointer analysis is hard. So putting those two together is, is not a good mix. Or we could be optimistic and say, hey, there's probably no aliasing here. Let's just you know, plow, plow ahead anyway. And of course, that's not the kind of safety assumption that we want to make. With Veil, vale, we're actually in a, a very unique and fortunate position that we are already having the developer do this verification work to prove that their code is functionally correct. And so we can actually take advantage of that to make alias analysis way, way easier. So in particular, while we're doing the functional verification, we already have to prove a lot of properties that are relevant for information flow. So for example, if our specification for this little assembly snippet was the output should be zero, then the only way you can possibly make the specs go through is if you've already proven that the RAX and RBX are not equal. Right? Because if you haven't proven that, then the, the functional verifier is not going to sign off on the fact that you met the spec. The same thing is true for something like something much larger like SHA. Right? You can't prove that your output buffer contains the hash of the input if there's a possibility that you might have clobbered the output as you were working your way through the hash function. And so to prove the functional correctness of your hash function, you're already having to reason about aliasing at a, a fairly deep level. And so our approach with mail is to leverage that effort and ask the developer to add just a little bit more information when they're doing loads and stores. And so what they, the information they add is a claim that they're loading or storing from, they're saying this is a, a secret load or this is a public load. And the functional correctness is going to check that those annotations are correct. So you can imagine that in the, the verification state, we have with all the values that are stored in memory, and now we augment those values with secret or public. And so if you write something to a memory location and say it's secret, we say, sure, we'll make that secret. And if later you try and read from that and claim that it's a public read, then that's going to fail the functional verification. Okay, so we're not actually checking whether you're sort of accurately describing that it's a secret store, but we're just taking your word. If you say this is a secret, we're gonna believe you're a secret. And all we're going to enforce is that you are acting with memory consistently when it comes to secret and public values. The nice thing about this approach, though, is that we can now use it in our, our taint analysis. Right? So the taint analysis is going to be running over the contents of the registers and maintaining sort of standard taint information about the registers. But now every time there's a read or write to memory, the taint analysis knows soundly whether that's a, a secret or public read or write. Right? And so if it's decided that a register contains a secret, and then we try and do a public write of that secret, that's automatically a problem, and the taint analysis will report that. And so with relatively little effort from the developer, we get a, a very accurate and sound analysis of the aliasing that's going on inside of the, the taint analysis. 
So the quick summary of what we're doing at the Veil level is that we've actually put together this framework that's designed to be correct, secure, and fast when it comes to verifying cryptographic implementations. We're able to achieve the fast part because we have a very flexible syntax that allows you to write all those weird tricks that OpenSSL was doing, but we can still verify them. So we can verify it by connecting to various proof backends. And we can also, because we're treating the AST of the, the code as a, a first class primitive within the proof assistant, we can actually write verified transformations or verified analysis of that code. So things like the information leakage analysis or some other uh, transformers that we've, we've developed in, in related work. So let's return to the, the larger story of how this all fits together to produce a, a high performance crypto provider. And the main takeaway here is that we're able to actually match or exceed the performance of state-of-the-art implementations, regardless of whether they've been verified or, or if they're unverified. So the main goal is to say, you no longer have to make this choice between verified code and fast code, you can actually have both. And so hopefully that is a, a sufficiently compelling argument that people will start switching to code that has been formally verified. So as a concrete example, this is showing our performance with a particular hash function, SHA-256. And the x-axis is showing hashing for various increasingly large message sizes. Y-axis shows how many cycles per byte it takes. So we want to be lower is better. The first two bars, the purple and green, show portable versions from EverCrypt and from OpenSSL. So you can think of these as C-level implementations that'll run on any platform. And you can see that our, our portable implementation is slightly beating OpenSSL by, by a couple of cycles per byte. And then the next two bars, the blue and the orange, are showing the performance of targeted implementations. So ones that are taking advantage of Intel's instructions specifically for computing SHA. And you can see that we are again at parity with OpenSSL and that there's almost a, a 3x to 4x difference between this targeted implementation and the, the portable version. So we really are getting a big benefit from having custom assembly, but it's nice to have this fallback to C for platforms that don't have this magic instruction from Intel. Here's a, another example. Uh, this is looking at uh, authenticated encryp uh, encryption. And here we're looking at uh, cycles per byte. So again, y-axis lower is better. And along the x-axis, we have increasing message sizes. And we also have different algorithms. In this case, we're looking at targeted implementations. So these are both implementations that will only run on special versions of Intel that have AS and I support. And the first takeaway is that the, the two bars on the left-hand side representing AS are significantly beating the cha-cha implementation. Right? They're almost two, two times faster. And again, that comes mostly from taking advantage of Intel's kindness in providing us with AS and I instructions. And the second takeaway is that our EverCrypt implementation, shown in blue, is once again slightly beating the OpenSSL performance. And so, and if you look at a high level for things, for larger messages, so we got up to eight or eight kilobytes or more, both implementations are at less than one cycle per byte to provide you with this very strong authenticated encryption guarantee. So again, I, I find this kind of mind boggling that you can do it that efficiently. And again, we are matching OpenSSL and providing that, that performance. At the asymmetric level, we can see a similar story. So this is looking at a particular elliptic curve, 25519, which is quite popular these days. The verified implementations are shown in green, unverified are shown in red. And you can see that there's many different implementation styles in terms of the particular radix that's being used for the elliptic curve and the big, big number operations, and in the languages that people are implementing them. I think the important takeaway from my perspective is that the EverCrypt, the portable version of EverCrypt, you can think of as the, the C-level version, is actually beating all previous C implementations and some of the assembly versions that have been sort of customized to use high-speed assembly. And the second takeaway, of course, is that the targeted version of EverCrypt is beating all the previous implementations. So we're, at least at the time we published these results, we're the fastest ones in the world, verified or unverified. Now, of course, these are very finicky performance results. If you measure it on a slightly different platform, you might get slightly different numbers. If the weather is a little bit warmer one day, maybe it'll go a little bit faster, a little bit slower. So I think it's less important the, you know, who's beating whom in terms of you know, hundreds of cycles. I think the more important takeaway is from a verification standpoint, we don't have to apologize for performance anymore. Right? We don't have to say, oh, you know, we're, we're 2x slower, 10x slower, please take our, our code anyway. We can say, hey, we can give you the same performance and strong guarantees. And these, these low level performance results also translate higher to applications that are built on top of them. So using EverCrypt, we can actually write some nice clean proofs for things like HMAC and HKDF or even Merkle trees 
And none of these implementations have to depend on the details of the underlying hash function. So these implementations are agile by inheriting and continuing to propagate the agility of the underlying Evercrypt library. We've also started using it for more complex protocols like, like Quick. And again, Quick gets to benefit from this layer of abstraction. So just to look at a specific example, we have a Merkle tree library. It uses a fairly complex implementation based on incremental construction with the goal of making it so that every insert takes an expectation, a single hash to continue building the tree. And of course, Merkle trees are quite popular these days in the cryptocurrency community. And so you want your hash, hash tree to go as fast as possible so you can process as many transactions as possible. And the nice thing about our construction here is that we're actually able to prove that it's functionally correct. So we really are building a proper tree, even though we're doing it in this kind of funky style. And we can prove cryptographic properties as well. So we can prove that if you manage to find a collision in the Merkle tree, in other words, you find two sets of data that both result in the, the same Merkle root, then we can turn that concretely into a collision on the un underlying hash function. And so that's the exact guarantee you would like, which conversely says that if the ha underlying hash function is collision resistant, then so is the Merkle tree. And in terms of performance, this graph is showing the time, number of insertions per second that we can do versus the size of the tree. The fact that it's more or less constant across the graph tells you that we are in fact achieving our goal of uh, O of one insertion time, regardless of how big the tree is. And the important takeaway is that we are getting over 2.5 million insertions per second, whereas Bitcoin's implementation, which presumably has seen some optimization, is uh, much slower. We're, we're almost three times faster than Bitcoin's implementation. And so again, we are not apologizing for performance. We're actually offering better performance and, and better guarantees for, for our applications. So before I wrap up, I thought I would maybe pass along some of the lessons we've learned in verifying all this cryptographic code. One thing is that when it comes to verification, there are decidable theories, ones for which we actually have algorithms that can, at least in theory, always give us a de decisive answer. And those are great when, when you can use them, but when you're doing low level systems programming, which is what you need to do to get good performance in a lot of these systems, you need to be able to talk about things for which there are not good decision procedures, things like quantifiers, nonlinear arithmetic, sets and sequences. And so we need tools that can handle both decidable and undecidable uh, properties. As a programmer, somebody who's developing this code, the ideal situation is to have fast but predictable behavior. Right? So I'm a big believer in automation. I love having the, the prover surprise me with all the things that can observe without any help from me. But I still want it to be predictable. So magic, magic boxes that work sometimes and don't work other times are not so helpful because then I don't know how to help the tool when, when it doesn't work. So in particular, I think the formal methods community needs more work on being able to debug automated tools when they fail. Because frankly, that is the default case. Right? When the proof works, we move on and we, we start working on another proof that is not working. And so most of the time our proofs are not working and so the more help you can give us when we're in that state, the better. And similarly, when automation fails, it often leads to a whole lot of manual work, including manual annotation, which then makes your code bigger and harder to maintain. Because it, then when you come back to it and look at the proof, it's hard to tell which of these lines was put there just to debug the failure, as opposed to a line that was actually necessary to make the, the program go through. And also it turns out because of this, humans do appreciate human readable proofs. So sometimes we actually write longer, more complex proofs because we want to be able to understand how it's working both so that we can make it the original proof go through, but more importantly, make it easier to maintain. So that when somebody else comes along and looks at that code, they can say, oh yes, I see where you're going here. I can see why this step might have failed. Let me patch it up here, as opposed to just seeing, well, it used to take a magical leap. It's not taking that magical leap anymore. Who knows what, what, what was going on here? And in our work, we, we use tools that rely heavily on quantifiers, so universal and existential quantifiers. And most of the, our tools, manage those with what are called triggers, syntactic triggers for deciding when to instantiate those. And despite the best efforts that have gone into automating the use of those quantifiers and the triggers around them, automation there never works perfectly. And so the more the languages can do to help us, the, the better uh, in terms of letting us see where they're failing and letting us plan how we're going to manage those quantifiers. So that's a little bit of a low de level detail, but hopefully this gives you some sense of the, the takeaways from people who have been banging on these tools for quite a while. So just to summarize where we've been here, 
with EverCrypt, we've hopefully offered you the, the car of your dreams. It's fully verified, secure, and uh, comprehensive. It offers more cryptographic algorithms than you can possibly fit in the utility belt. And in doing so, it also gives you all the great performance that you want from state-of-the-art cryptographic systems. And we've done this in the context of the larger Everest project, which aims to provide deployable, provably secure communication at an internet scale. So with that, I'll say thank you. And thanks so much for paying attention to this, this virtual talk. Thank you so much for the amazing talk. Uh, we can now take some questions. If you have questions, you can just unmute yourself, uh, speak up, or if um, you want, you can also type the question into the chat. Um, so actually to, to begin, um, I had a question about uh, the specification. So like, I felt like um, it's a little bit hard to understand exactly uh, what is being proven. And also I had, uh, had a question about like how hard or easy is it to actually verify that the specification is correct? Sure. Or, or maybe proves what we want to actually prove about these uh, cryptographic primitives. Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, we have a, a variety of flavors of specification in, in our system. So the first flavor is functional specification. And so for each of our cryptographic algorithms like SHA or AS or RSA, we try and write down a small, succinct, functional description of what those algorithms are supposed to do. So often we're doing that with the RFC or the, uh, the specification from IETF, the English ver version in one hand, and the you know, proof assistant, the F star in the other hand. And we write down as clean and succinct a description as we can in F star as a series of functions. And ideally you should be able to look at that on one screen and look at the other, the English level description do sort of a one for one to one mapping between those two to get a sense of that we, we got it right. Now, of course, to reinforce that, we have resorted to a number of measures. One is that we have uh, actually done manual spec review. So if somebody who's not involved, we hand it off to them and say, hey, compare these two, see if they look the same. That's actually been surprisingly effective in catching bugs along the way. We also, one of the reasons why we write our specs in a fully functional style is that we can actually extract them to runnable code. And so we can actually run standard test vectors against our implementations or our, our specifications. And of course, the specifications are horribly slow. We write them you know, recursively in, using immutable data structures. And it's not something you would use in practice, but it's enough that you can render vectors and you know, any other test vectors you wanted to compare it against existing systems. The next level of specification we have is for the underlying hardware. And so at some level, we have to say, how does Intel behave? And again, there we write down our best description in terms of a, uh, a formal semantics um, of what the Hard, so the state of the hardware, and then how do you take a step in, in the semantics, which is typically by executing an instruction or some structured control flow. And there again, you have to sit and look at our description and look at say the Intel manual and convince yourself that we got them correct. Now that's, that was what we did in the olden days. These days there's actually a set of formal specifications that ARM has released for, for their hardware. And there's a group at uh, UIUC that's released a, a formal spec in the K framework for X64, a large fraction of X64. Unfortunately, one of the pieces they left out was the AS instructions, so it's not a, a direct, uh, something we can use directly, but I think it suggests that the world as a whole is moving towards more formal verification specifications, and then we could just import those wholesale and not have to do our sort of, uh, custom, custom versions that we've built for ourselves. And then at the very highest level of our stack, we are actually writing down cryptographic specifications. So we're translating cryptographic definitions like what does it mean to have a, a secure encryption scheme or what does it mean to have a secure channel? And then we are using our low level primitives and trying to prove that those, if you use the primitives in this particular fashion, you will wind up with a secure channel. And that relies on additional assumptions. Like at one point in our proof, we have to say, if you believe that the uh, hash function that you've chosen is secure, then you get a secure channel. And so then it's up to the user to say, yes, I believe that SHA-1 is secure or I, I believe that SHA-2 is secure. And given that assumption, we then give you the promise of the secure channel. Ryan, when you uh, are specifying things, uh, relational properties like non-interference, at what level do those get expressed? So the non-interference property for the assembly code gets expressed in terms of the, the trace of the observations maintained by the semantics for the underlying machine. So about as low as we can go without getting into microarchitectural details. So at the moment, our proofs don't actually say anything about whether we're 
susceptible to specter and meltdown. We could, in theory, augment them to add that. Right? There's just more observations, more, more kinds of things that would go into the trace. Um, at some level, I feel like those problems are something that are better solved at the hardware level. You know, hardware people broke this, they should be the ones that fix it. But uh, in theory, we could add it there. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, Yes, yeah, so the first question is actually related to EasyCrypt. Easy crypt. And maybe, maybe this has to do like with the, the top level of uh, specification you mentioned, like, you know, EasyCrypt is designed to like verify things like assuming, let's say this uh, cryptographic hash function is collision resistant. I want to prove that the Merkle tree, uh, let's say is co collision resistant. So it seems like this part of the task maybe overlaps a little bit with the uh, EasyCrypt. Um, so I guess the, the question is related to that, but actually I also have another question, like how, how do you think like the community can kind of work together to, to you know, make it um, happen, like basically realistic, formally verified crypto code everywhere? Um, yeah, so I think, so a couple answers. So I think, yes, if you want to be doing high level cryptographic proofs, EasyCrypt is certainly another good choice for that. Um, and, it's a, and can handle some aspects of cryptographic proofs that are not inherently handled by FSTAR at the moment. For example, in our cryptographic proof, so the Merkle tree is a, a convenient example where you don't have to reason about probability. You just say, if you give me a collision, I can just trace that back through the Merkle tree and somewhere there's gonna be a collision on the hash function. So that's pretty straightforward. So if you wanna start getting into proofs that say, well, this, this uh, cryptographic mode is secure up to, you know, the probability that we get a collision on our our block cipher, then that kind of proof, we can push that proof up to the top level and say, it's secure up to the pro probability of a collision. And you know, the size of our block cipher is this big, but in FSTAR right now, we don't reason about the actual concrete value of that probability. That's something we have to do on paper and pencil. Whereas EasyCrypt has that kind of reasoning built in and so you can talk about those probabilities directly. Um, in terms of how we can get the community, all these different community efforts more integrated, I think there's been some efforts in that direction. So one of my colleagues, Karthik, was involved in an effort to create a, a standard language that people that are writing sort of RFCs or IETF documents for cryptographic algorithms can be specified in. Right? Today, it's often written in ASC, some combination of text and ASCII diagrams. So they have a, a language that's supposed to be fairly friendly to standards writers but they can then be translated into specs in various backends. So the idea is that you'd have an automatic tool that would produce F star specs and uh, cock specs and easy crypt specs. And that would at least give us a, a common starting point for the high level specifications. I think integrating at a lower level is more complex in terms of saying, hey, I proved this in cock. How do I import that proof into F star? I think that's a maybe understudied area at the moment. Uh, we have a few more questions on the chat. Uh, so there's a question from uh, Marco uh, Garnieri. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on the machine semantics for Veil? Are those ISA level semantics or do they include also micro architectural aspects? And the second question is how, how conservative is your taint analysis approach? Did you encounter secure code that could not be proven secure? Yeah, so for the first question, um, yeah, so the, the, the Veil specs are ISA level specifications. So as I alluded to earlier, they're augmented with information about what we think the adversary can see, things like uh, the branches, which relate to timing, and the memory addresses, which relate to sort of cache level leakage. They don't at the moment include microarchitectural details like speculative execution. It could be extended that direction, but that's not something we've done yet. Um, for the second one, the taint analysis, it's moderately conservative. It's, you know, there's nothing too exciting happening there. But the, the cool thing is that because it's happening inside of a verification framework, we can soundly extend it as much as we want. Right? So for example, our taint analysis takes advantage of the fact that we can provably show that XORing you know, the same register with itself sets it to zero, which is a, a public value. And rather than just assuming that's true, we can actually state that as a lemma. And, and F star plus Z3 says, oh, of course that's true. And so it's easy to add these extra rules because without you know, worrying that we're getting something wrong because we can take advantage of F star. And as a result of that, you no, know, all of our all of the code that we've tried uh, has been we've been able to prove, except for there was one bit of code that we imported from OpenSSL that actually had some 
state level leakage. So there was portions of secret influence data that were just lying around on, on the stack that they, they didn't clean up. Um, and so you know, that, that obviously wouldn't go through. And then we, we changed our code not to do that. And then, then it went through. So there are a couple questions about the, the side channel. Uh, one is from John Michael Anas and the other from Joe Neer. Uh, you mentioned it was proven that cryptography primitives didn't possess any timing side channels. How were this modeled in the CPU specifications and how was it proven? And Joe's question is related. Uh, are there other kinds of side channels that you consider in or out of scope for verifying these primitives? What is your philosophy for deciding? Sure, yeah, so uh, the main argument for why we are uh, not are resistant to timing based side channels is that we are allowing the adversary to see all essentially a trace of all the instructions that we execute and all of the memory addresses that we access. And we're proving that both of those quantities are uh, independent of the secret values. And there's actually some nice work from Gilles Barth and some of his co-authors showing that those two properties together give you timing independence as long as the instructions you're executing are themselves not dependent on, on the data that they're executing over. So in particular, we have to be careful to avoid things like division or say floating point operations because those are known to be timing dependent. But assuming that we got that right, which at the moment, the best we can do is look at the literature and see which instructions are dependent that way and which ones are not, then the total runtime should be independent of, of the secret information. Um, and the way that we prove that is so that, that's the specification. The way that we prove it is by running this, this taint analysis over our code. And the taint analysis itself is proven against that specification. The taint analysis says, if I give you an answer and say that the output is independent of the secrets, then that is guaranteed to preserve this non-interference property. Related to Joe's question, um, so we focus primarily on timing and memory because those are the ones that have the sort of strongest evidence that they can be easily exploited remotely, as opposed to something like electromagnetic radiation or sound or power draw, which are much harder to exploit remotely. Right? So those are definitely problems. And I think it's worth thinking about those. But typically, you need somebody in the room or near the room to be able to collect that information. Whereas something like timing, anybody on the internet can possibly launch that attack. Or even memory, you can argue that anybody, if can, if you're co-hosted in the cloud, can possibly see that information. And so those seem like more pressing concerns than the low level physical attacks. Now, one might hope that some of these precautions, you know, trying to make our uh, execution time and memory accesses independent of the secret would help you in being more resilient to power attacks. But of course, there's no, no guarantee there. I think you could try and model those. You could take a similar approach to you know, augmenting our observation model with and what is it, how much power do you leak when you do a, a multiplication versus an add? But that's something that you have to put more work into and have a, a better model of the, the hardware for. Uh, there's a question from Anita uh, Golamudi. Uh, it's about verifying uh, assembly. Can veil be used to verify unstructured assembly? That is, is arbitrary jump supported? And the second question is like, how do you report the CPU cycles as opposed to time in absolute seconds uh, on slide uh, 55? Sure, so uh, with most of our cryptographic code, we tend to verify structured assembly because that's how cryptographic code is typically written. We've started in some of the related projects that have spun out of this to verify unstructured code because it's a little bit more convenient for those projects. And there we, we take an approach very similar to what CompCert does, namely, the program as a whole is represented by blocks of assembly code, and you're allowed to jump to the beginning of any of those blocks. And so you just have a, a big list, and then a jump is a, a jump into an index in, in that list. So nothing too, too surprising, perhaps, but um, in some context, that, that does make the verification or the application easier to process. And the second question, why do we report numbers in CPU cycles? Um, again, it comes down to just these measurements are very idiosyncratic, and so measuring per cycle gives you maybe a better sense of a reproducible number versus the timing. Right? The timing may depend on just how fast the, the CPU happens to be clocked. This is a feels more fundamental on this particular CPU architecture. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think our paper probably says what the you know, 
on paper clock cycle is that you, you can translate into time? Thanks. Uh, I, there's another question from Su Han. Uh, can Vail handle security properties that involve quantifier alternation? Um, yeah, certainly. So uh, we're, we're using F star, which is nice general proof assistance, so we can verify all kinds of alternation. You may pay a little bit for that in terms of the extra annotations you have to add to, to the code, but uh, we, we can certainly handle uh, properties like that. Okay. So yeah, so we are actually on good time. And um, let's thank Brian again for the amazing talk. Uh, clap. <laughs> Thank you so much and feel free to l let me know if you have other questions afterwards. Uh, and the video of the talk will actually be uploaded to YouTube. Okay, so we will take a very short break and then the first session of the day, blockchain is going to start at 11.25 a.m.